Well, Health Minister Dr. Zwilim Kize says that uh, the President, Ronald Ramaphosa, has not yet indicated his intention to tighten the lockdown regulations. It would have been impossible to uh, uh, prevent all these variants that are coming from different parts of the world, particularly the countries that we have got re uh, strong relations with from lending in South Africa, because people move around and, of course, uh, they, these variants would have found their way into South Africa in any case. Nevertheless, at this point, we had not had evidence up until we confirmed over the weekend that uh, the variant that is B117, that's from that's been identified in the UK, has been found in uh, the 11 cases of those have been found. Now, how this happens, is someone comes in and then as they get detected, uh, they get uh, tested, then of course we go and uh, do genomic sequencing to see which variant they've got and that's how these have been found. The other four cases <clears throat> are people who have come from India and they have this variant that has been seen, uh, that's been diagnosed in India. Uh, they, they also have been an interesting of, uh, case of someone who came from outside and was found to be positive and then was found to have the variant that is actually in South Africa, but they come from Bangladesh. So it is clear that the movement of people and the mixing is what will actually give us this variant. I think what's important about it is the fact that uh, whatever variant we have, it's important for us to know that we use the same way of prevention of further spread. That is the use of masks, the distancing, you know, uh, washing of hands, sanitizers, and uh, keeping a good distance and staying ventilated places. It's very, very important for us to look at that rather than looking at the fact that, uh, you know, how did the person get here? Because people, uh, we've been discussing the issue of uh, restrictions. Uh, we have found that uh, there's no direct flight from India to South Africa. But yeah. that doesn't stop people going via different other countries to land up in South Africa. So what we need to focus on is how do we make sure that whatever the variant may be, we keep the containment measures strong so that people are able to be protected from any infection, irrespective of whether it's the variant that we had uh, or the other variants. There has been talk as well from uh, among scientists that although the one <clears throat> variant that's found in India is more transmissible there in India, which has been responsible for a, a huge number of new cases and deaths and so on, there are other issues of social behavior that are important there. Uh, however, when they looked at the level of uh, mutation between these variants, uh, the one that's in South Africa still has got more mutation with a higher chance <clears throat> excuse me, of eluding any protection from our uh, vaccine-generated immunity. So in India, they could still use AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and all the others, uh, which we have already got evidence here that it may not have been used. But either way, uh, you don't want any variant, whether it was a first variant or second variant, you don't want people to be, to be infected with that. So we have to focus on how to prevent the infection. Yeah. Well, President Cyril Ramaphosa has called on civil society organizations to mobilize international support for wider access to technologies needed to produce vaccines and medicines. In his uh, weekly letter to the nation, Ramaphosa says, in much as uh, the same way the sector played a critical role in successfully mobilizing global support for the manufacture of generic HIV retrovirals two decades ago, Civil society organizations can engender solidarity and cooperation with like-minded organizations in developed uh, countries. Uh, the aim would be to raise awareness and advocate for the promotion of health as a public and a social good. Right, for more on this, uh, we are now joined via Zoom by Dr. Linda Gale Becker. She is a co-principal uh, investigator on uh, Johnson & Johnson Ensemble Study and the Sasonke program uh, to help us understand uh, the progress in the vaccination process here in South Africa and, of course, the increasing number of new COVID-19 infections. Thank you so very much uh, for joining us, uh, Linda J uh, Gale Becker. We appreciate your time here on uh, SABC News. Thank you. Happy to be here. Of course, at the moment, the, the great concern is uh, the issue of the third wave. And then in particular, the, the variant uh, that was first discovered in India. How worried should we be? I mean, on, on one hand, uh, Linda, we, we see what's happening in India, which is obviously very scary to us. 
And uh, then on the other hand, you know, we're being told not to panic um, as the strain isn't as bad as some of the other strains uh, that we've already uh, sort of experienced. I mean, what's the actual story here? And maybe if you could just clarify for us and, you know, our viewers. Well, I think, you know, the level of concern always needs to be high. Um, variants mean that on the one hand, um, our own immune systems, even if we've been uh, infected before, might not be able to uh, protect against a new variant. Um, and of course, there's always concern that vaccines may see increased breakthrough with a new variant. So I think it is important that we as a nation continue to worry about genetic variation in this virus yeah. um, and keep our surveillance systems up high. Um, I think until we actually see in a laboratory or indeed on the ground what the what the response is to that variant, in other words, are we protected against it having been infected, say, during wave two or even in wave one, um, until we have that information in hand, I think it's just speculation. So yeah. perhaps the most important message is that we have to continue to keep a very focused and sharp eye on the virus and, and its mutations so that we can remain one step ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm not yet aware of data, you know, going in either direction. I have heard terms such as this is a variant of interest rather than a variant of concern. I think these are terms that sort of describe a spectrum. And, um, you know, as I say, I think the message is we have to continue to uh, observe, watch, uh, measure and respond appropriately as information comes in the door. Of course, our, our main uh, part of our conversation today, uh, of course, you're with J&J, uh, &J, is to, to talk about uh, the vaccine process and, and, and how that's, uh, that's really going. There has been a lot of criticism um, aimed at government that perhaps this is a lot slower than it should be and we had to pause at some stage, as of course you know. Uh, what can you tell us at uh, the moment, sort of, I don't, I don't know, allay some of the fears that are obviously out there in the public? Well, I think we've known that this was going to be a race against time, yeah. right? So um, getting vaccinations into people's arms is one of our protection methodologies. And it is for this reason that the Sasanki program was devised very quickly. Uh, we've managed to get it going and it looks like we'll hopefully get those 500,000 doses into arms before a third wave does take off. Yeah. And we focused particularly on healthcare workers because, as has been discussed around the world, this is the group you really want to protect because they have to stay on their feet in order to provide health and care for anybody who may go down with COVID in turn. So I'm very grateful that we were able to leverage the Sasanki 3B study. Um, and, you know, we are doing our every um, effort to make sure that we reach what we had promised was the 500,000 doses by the end of the week. There's no doubt that thereafter, we, we have to keep up the pressure to see how quickly we can roll out 1B and phase two, constantly um, trying to stay ahead of, uh, of increasing infections. Clearly, the more people we have protected, the better it is for those individuals and for the country as a whole. So I think that it remains uh, an important goal that we, we vaccinate as quickly as we can, recognizing that ob obviously you have to have the vaccines in hand in yeah. order to administer them. So I think it's it's continual um, pressure and, and urgency to get those vaccines into the country. And then I'm confident that, you know, we will be able to get them out and into people's arms as soon as we have them here on hand. I'm delighted that phase 1B should be starting next week. Um, and as I say, I'm very proud that we've been able to deliver on what we promised, which was that 500,000 healthcare workers by this Friday. 
Yeah, you know, I'm glad that there are some uh, positives uh, that have uh, obviously come out of uh, the Sasanke study, but with most very important uh, studies, there's, there's always uh, going to be some uh, concerns or, or, or some problems, uh, perhaps, that might have then been highlighted. Um, and I wonder if you could perhaps talk to us about that. One of the, one of the things that, you know, I've, I've kind of been concerned about, and, I, you know, I'm sure you can uh, talk, talk further on this, is whether or not uh, these vaccines would be able to work Work, even though you know we're introduced to to new variants I mean I'm not only talking about the variant that was uh, discovered in India but we don't know which other variants could then be introduced to uh, to our country and I just I just wonder with all these uh, vaccines could we find a situation where yes people are getting vaccinated but then we've got all these variants that are coming in these new variants that are, that, 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 that are now becoming problematic and these vaccines can't really fight against yeah, I mean, it's not only about variants coming in, it's actually variants being, you know, developed yeah. um, in our own country while we speak. So, you know, this virus is an RNA virus, it, it, it mutates, um, and some of it may be imported in, uh, some of it may actually develop right here on our shores. So surveillance is absolutely key, and we're very lucky in this country that we have that technology and uh, expertise to be able to survey uh, real time on a daily basis. And so I know that every single swab that comes in um, is being inspected in this regard. There is a great deal of effort going into making sure that if a new variant of concern comes about, we will be uh, aware of that. And then you're absolutely right. We have to know whether the vaccines we've got on hand are strong enough uh, to deal with that. Now, we know that Johnson & Johnson actually does have efficacy against the 501Y uh, V2, which you know, we is is seriously a variant of concern. We know that it's had an impact on all the vaccines around the world to date, not e eliminating their efficacy, but reducing their efficacy. And so that absolutely remains a concern. And again, a reason why we have to keep our our monitoring and our evaluation going throughout this process so that we always know. Um, having said that, even if uh, the vaccine doesn't work at the rate at which we saw it in the trials at the beginning of the pandemic, it's unlikely to be completely wiped out. So it's likely people will still get benefit, even if it's not complete benefit. And the analogy here is influenza. So we know that influenza uh, also mutates regularly. Uh, we try to stay ahead in terms of, of how the vaccine should look, but we do know that even last season's vaccine has some value. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is likely to be, um, you know, it may be how the, the world is going to look from SARS-CoV-2 point of view as well. We have to keep ahead and keep uh, monitoring this. Yeah, and no doubt uh, the issue of pandemic fatigue and uh, people kind of not adhering uh, to all the protocols is uh, causing a, a lot more problems as well. And I wonder if what you've picked up in terms of uh, your study. I mean, while we're in the midst of uh, worrying about variants, and as you've just uh, informed us now, the issue of variants that are developing right here, uh, in the country as as we speak i mean let's talk to that and, and perhaps it's important for viewers to constantly be reminded that look we're still in uh, the midst of this uh, pandemic whether or not you know we're suffering from uh, pandemic fatigue i'm sure all of us are tired of wearing masks and doing all the things that we're supposed to do um uh, but 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 maybe it is important to to speak to that and and, and how it affects some of the, the the processes uh that you'd like to see going forward particularly in terms of vaccinations yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that, you know, whilst vaccines are a very important component of our prevention and our, our strategy to deal with SARS-CoV-2, the other non-pharmaceutical interventions remain critical. Um, it is, you know, my, my normal hunting ground is HIV. We don't just 
rely on on a single entity there. We have to come at prevention with a multi-factual, multi-strategy um, type of approach. And yes. it's going to be the same for SARS-CoV-2. So people are going to have to just, you know, hang in there for a little bit longer. Um, we're going to continue to grapple with, with COVID. And that means masks, avoiding closed spaces, avoiding crowded environments, ventilating rooms wherever we can, um, and making sure that where we share air, um, we, you know, we allow ourselves uh, space um, and and ventilation to in ensure that, um, you know, we safeguard each other. Uh, masks are, are going to remain part of our, yeah. our armamentarium for at least uh, the next while. All right, uh, Linda uh, Gail Becker, thank you so much uh, for your input. It's much appreciated here on SABC News. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that is uh, Linda Gail Becker. She's the co principal investigator on Johnson and Johnson uh, uh, Sasonke program, helping us to understand, uh, of course, the progress in the vaccination process uh, here in South Africa. Let's